All right, thank you very much. My name is David Freed, um, the CTO for Coventer. I'd like to quickly thank Semi for inviting me to give a talk here. I'd really like to thank Semi for putting me right after the virtual reality guy. Um, the VR guys always have the best material, but I'm going to bring us back to semiconductor manufacturing here. And I'm going to talk a little bit about 3D model-based process control for semiconductor manufacturing. Uh, I truly believe this is the future of smart semiconductor manufacturing. And actually, some of these examples are, are already taking place. Uh, so in my talk, I'm going to give a, a very brief introduction to virtual fabrication. This is really what we do. Uh, and I'll describe our software, Simulator 3D. Uh, but then I'm going to shift gears, I'm going to move into model-based process control, talk about our motivation, and a couple very key examples here, model-based metrology, model-based patterning, and full model-based manufacturing. Okay, so if you look at future and, and even current technology trends, we're seeing uh, a tremendous amount of structural complexity. So. Uh, people talk about vertical devices, 3.5 devices, and even uh, nanowire devices. I actually found vertical 3.5 nanowire devices. Uh, so structural complexity in the transistor and the devices is exploding. Patterning technology, we've gone from single patterning to self-aligned double patterning, quad patterning, and even self-aligned octuplet patterning. And then uh, devices are sort of moving around from their traditional homes to different places of the technology. We're starting to see passive devices move up into the back end of line and memory devices in the back end as well. So we're seeing a, just a tremendous amount of structural complexity through the flow. Um, cost and development cycle are going with that structural complexity. So uh, what's limiting manufacturing, volume manufacturing, is structural, systematic structural defectivity, not just random. So uh, what can we do to, to counter these trends? We can just run more and more wafers in the fab, trial and error, uh, experiments in the fab, but that's extremely expensive and time consuming. And traditional TCAT solutions really don't address this fundamental integration and structural challenge. So uh, at Coventor, we're providing virtual solutions for this major problem. Uh, and we call this, this subject virtual fabrication. Okay, so uh, this is Simulator 3D. This is the sort of uh, 35,000 foot view of what Simulator 3D does. It's a virtual fabrication platform. Uh, we organize this software just like the fab. So at the heart of our software is our voxel modeling engine. And voxel modeling is quite different than any other process modeling platform. Uh, it's very robust for arbitrary levels of, of complex 3D geometry. And we have a lot of IP surrounding voxel modeling, so we can do this very, very fast. So voxel modeling is one of the key pieces about uh, our speed advantage in modeling. But this is our fab. This is our virtual fab. And just like in a normal fab, you, you install a process, and then you run designs. We take those same two different, uh, yeah. same two input streams. Uh, so we have, I should not step on that. We have a layout editor for bringing in design data. And we have a process editor where we describe a step-by-step -step process flow in a behavioral set of parameters. Okay, so design plus process goes into the fab. A normal fab makes silicon wafers, we make virtual wafers. So what you see here on the right, right side of the chart is step-by-step, -step, process predictive 3D model of whatever layout you ran through whatever process. It works. Um, it's very robust for any process and any design. Um, the most mainstream usage for this type of software and technology is in technology development. Uh, fast prototyping, exploratory flow development, things like that. So we're heavily entrenched in technology development for logic and memory, MEMS, silicon photonics, all sorts of integrated technologies. Now, it's really important to recognize what, what we're doing here is really integration modeling. Okay? If you want to model uh, an individual unit process, an individual deposition or etch, you would probably start from equipment level parameters and do what we call unit process modeling or chamber scale modeling. And you can get a, a very good result for one single unit process. The problem is it's very, very difficult to stack up 500 or 1,000 unit process models to model integration over a large area of design. So we do what we call model abstraction. We abstract unit process or chamber scale model to behavioral models. 
So an etch now, instead of gas flows and plasma energies, would be described by depth and lateral ratio or material selectivities and things like that, the actual behaviors of the etch. By doing that, we can stack up hundreds and thousands of different processes in the full integrated process flow and very, very quickly come to a, an integrated result with process predictive 3D uh, silicon accurate geometry. Okay, so as I said, many people are using this for technology development, flow exploration, prototyping. Um, but now I'm going to change gears a little bit. I'm going to move more into process control using this type of technology. So now I'm going to take a, a very, very simplified view of process controls here. Um, you have wafers moving through the fab. Usually they'll hit a measurement operation or some metrology. They get another process performed on the wafers and there's an outgoing measurement or metrology operation. So very, very simple process flow view. Um, often you can take data from uh, measurement and metrology and feed that back to the process on, uh, operation. It's called feedback process control. And this really enables process adjustment for later hardware, hardware that comes afterwards, or if you're going to rework these wafers. Um, this really only requires knowledge of what do I tune on this process to impact this metrology? So simple process to metrology knowledge. Um, feed forward process control is a little bit more challenging, and this basically enables compensation for prior variation on the wafers. This can be extremely powerful, okay? Now, it places some additional requirements on upstream metrology. If you're going to adjust the process, you need to know what adjustments to make, and it requires a bit more knowledge of what I call metrology process, metrology relationship. Based on upstream metrology, what do you adjust in the process to hit downstream metrology? Okay, it's a bit more complicated, but it's potentially much more valuable. So as I said before, these technology trends of 3D devices, multi-patterning, all this process complexity, what's happening right now is we're seeing process equipment with many more adjustment capabilities. And frankly, we need them. Okay, the devices and the technologies are so complicated that we need these adjustment capabilities in the fab. But requirements on metrology with these complex devices and flows are becoming significant fab throughput problems. Um, and then these relationships, these complex devices between metrology process and subsequent metrology, they become many to many complex relationships that are very difficult to manage. Um, so how do you manage very complex many-to-many -many relationships like this? You need process predictive 3D structural models to handle these very complex relationships and handle uh, this type of process control. So now I'm going to try to hop through a couple of examples here of how you can use models and, and in some cases how they're already being used to do this type of control. So I'll start with metrology. Um, Model-based metrology is actually uh, becoming mainstream. So the example I use here is, is diffraction-based measurement or scatterometry, sometimes referred to as OCD. Uh, the advantage is, is that it's optical, so it's very, very fast, very low uh, total measurement uncertainty, and you can use this to measure product-like structures. So scatterometry is really becoming quite mainstream. The challenge of this, you shine light across the grating, you measure the spectra, you need a model to fit that spectra and determine what the geometry is on the wafer. So the model becomes a challenge here, and the advanced technologies have a lot of structural complexity, making those models difficult. So I grabbed a model here off the Nova website, a uh, company we've worked with, and you look, this is the type of 3D geometric model that's used in a scatterometry recipe to fit the spectra and determine uh, geometric offsets. Now, because the structures are so complex, you have to simplify these models into a geometric scheme. Uh, by doing that, you neglect real process variation, incoming variation, and they're very difficult to adjust as you change the process through the flow. Um, these models, you have to simplify them to get through the, the solver, so you have to choose to fix some parameters and float others. Um, and by doing that, you basically oversimplify a lot of the process. So where this is moving is to do more process-based models. Um, so here, what I'm, what I'm showing is uh, Simulator 3D. This is our viewer showing uh, the fin patterning in a fin-fed technology. And you can see some of the subtle details of this patterning technology. You have a little bit of pitch walk, a little bit of pattern dependence, some depth, uh, uh, varying depth between the fins. But this is real. This is what happens in process. Um, 
what we're able to do is then take Simulator 3D real process predictive geometry and port that directly into the Nova Mars platform to do automatic recipe generation for OCD and scatterometry. Now I have a real process predictive model, much more realistic, and able to measure and analyze much more detailed variations in the flow. Okay, so the conventional metrology flow here is, I start with a geometric model. So this has dimensional parameters. You know, so geometric model is literally rectangles and trapezoids and geometry. Parameter A2 is, is, is this dimension at the bottom of the spacer flow. It's not real process parameters. If you go through the measurement recipe, you solve, you get a geometric result. You then have to take that geometric result and drive it back to process root cause. That's very, very difficult. So where this is going, in my view, is to use a more process-centric metrology model. So now I have a real process predictive behavioral model because we can do this so very quickly in virtual fabrication. We go through the measurement. The result now is process behavioral results. So instead of saying geometric parameter A2 is off by one nanometer, this type of result comes back and says your oxide edge selectivity is off by 10%. It's a much more structured answer, it's a much more process-based result, and you can take action on that by adjusting tool parameters very quickly. Another example here, uh, lithography alignment. When the wafers come into the lithography tool, they have to be aligned. Uh, this depends on custom marks or custom structures on the wafer to align the, metrology, or align the uh, lithography tool. If you have alignment errors, that induces offsets and overlay, variation. Failures to align actually stop the fabrication line. Uh, if you look at technologies early in manufacturing, um, wafers failing to align is a massive throughput problem in the fab. Um, so how do you how do you improve this situation? You can either optimize the fabrication process specifically for alignment marks. If you try to do that, your process integration team gets very angry with you. You can optimize the alignment metrology system for whatever marks are coming. That's very difficult because it takes tool and equipment changes to, to make that happen. And the most tractable solution really is to optimize your mark designs for the process you're running and for the measurement system. Uh, sometimes this might take uh, a, a new mask, so you have mask lead times here, but it's the most tractable solution for fixing this. So just an example of what we're able to do to optimize the, the mark designs if we take mark design GDS data, and this is just an example of a, a thin and cut alignment mark, a very typical alignment mark in a thin-fed technology, modeled through Simulator 3D and virtual fabrication. Here we can look at lots of different process options and process variations. We interface directly to ASML's D4C optical simulator, and what we're able to do here is look across multiple different wavelengths in the alignment system what the reproducibility, alignment, position deviation, and wafer quality would be for that mark. So now we can choose our mark designs, we can optimize mark designs, or choose which mark to use, and choose which wavelength to use in alignment to get the highest alignment accuracy for a given technology. Okay, and before I get into this, I will warn you, this slide has made people a little seasick, so we'll be careful. Um, I want to move into defect inspection for a little bit here. So uh, the typical flow for defect inspection is use an optical, very fast optical inspection to uh, positionally locate defects. And what you usually get out of that is you get a wafer maps and die locations of, of where these defects are occurring, but not much more information. Uh, the wafers then get fed into what's called SEM review. This is SEM based, very slow, obviously the vacuum process. But here you get a lot more information per defect. You get some defect imaging, defect analysis. That information then has to be classified. That classification is, was previously done human classification. We have teams of engineers doing this. Uh, we're getting uh, a little bit more advanced and doing some of this with CPUs now, but it's still a very complex process to classify these defects to take action against them. So where we can add virtual fabrication to this, at the point of inspection, we know the die location. So I immediately know the design in the area of the defect. I know what process level that wafer has been built up to. I can build what we call a preemptive model. And this in includes all of the upstream metrology and, and process variation, and I built it directly up to the inspection level. I don't know anything about the defect, but the model is ready to go for each of those locations. At the point of SEM review, now we can impart a defect. 
in the appropriate location, the appropriate defect size and material, we can impart the defect. This is nearly instantaneous. So this can be done at the speed of the wafers running through the fab. And then the models can continue to run through the flow and we can do automated checking and analysis to say, okay, this defect, if it's this material embedded at that depth, that will cause a two gate short, a sort of hemispherical metallic short between two gates. And now I have automated electrical testing to classify this defect and its impact electrically. Okay, so this is, a, this is essentially taking the same process through the fab, but applying virtual fabrication to really highly educate what's going on educate the engineers as to the real root cause of the defect and the, and the impact at the electrical test level. And I'll turn this off so nobody gets nauseous. Uh, finally, as we start to expand this, and we see so many different model uh, metrology operations going to model-based technology, we really have to be careful that we're not all developing our own models in a vacuum. So there is a high value to what we call model unification. Being able to use a single 3D geometric process model to feed multiple different inspection or metrology sources. Uh, this allows you to have a consistent set of structural assumptions and a consistent feedback to the process actions if it's a process-based model. So I think it's really important to, uh, uh, to consider model unification, just the value of having the same model feeding multiple different metrology operations. This becomes very, very important also as we progress into virtual metrology. I'm uh, sorry, uh, hybrid metrology where you have multiple different metrology operations for the same type of measurement. Okay, so now I want to move a little bit into model-based patterning for hotspot identification and, and triage. Okay, so in patterning, OPC has always used models. So we're very comfortable with model-based model OPC. That's pretty much uh, current technology. So models take into account optical effects and they correct the shapes on the mask to achieve the right shapes on the wafer. This is essentially a form of feed-forward uh, process control because you're changing something on the mask to achieve a later result. Now, OPC and its inherent or associated checking is inherently 2D. You're going to OPC a single level to be put on a single mask. Uh, 2D means it's fast uh, and it has to be fast because the entire design has to go through the OPC operation. And this is excellent for checking printability issues. 2D uh, single level printability issues. The problem is it's very, very difficult to check for 3D integration issues in a 2D checking methodology. Uh, now there are 3D optical and resist modeling, uh, but typically those aren't really extendable. As I said, those are unit process models, not extendable for full integration, and they're too slow to extend to large area applications. So we need to find some hybrid approach where we can look at massive design data sets but then focus in on uh, specific regions in more detail. So uh, this is a data flow that's actually been deployed and is implemented at some of the foundries now, where design data is passed through the OPC and ORC, ORC being the checking techniques after OPC. Um, the OPC and ORC tool doing its 2D operations, producing a set of contours, print simulated contours, and potential hotspot locations. So regions of concern in the 2D OPC. Those contours and locations are then fed into simulator 3D with more information of the process flow to then examine what is the 3D result of that 2D area of concern. So here you can see we've actually reconstructed the resist profile based on multiple elevations of contours that are coming out of an OPC engine. Um, now this is sort of the, the end of that hotspot checking demo where once we've looked at all these locations and we've allowed them to process through the rest of the flow, we can check them in an automated fashion and start to get more 3D type failure results. You can look at 2D hotspots and say some of these aren't issues, ignore them in 3D, or some things that maybe were a little marginal in 2D have significant deleterious effects in 3D. Okay, so this is just an automated checking technique for the same model-based hotspot triage. Um, that previous example, we, we started from 2D OPC contours, but we can do exactly the same type of operation starting from 3D resist profiles, from something like ProLift. Now, you get a ProLift result of a 3D resist, and you say, well, that, that might be just fine. I don't know. I have to understand how it processes through the rest of the flow. So here we're looking at a gate patterning of a FinFET flow. We have a, a 3D resist profile from ProLift, and as it goes through the 
sacrificial gate etching. You can see the smoothing and the transfer. And then when it gets to the metal fill of the replacement metal gate, there may be a significant problem. But this is dramatically downstream in the process flow where the actual failure emerges. And you can see we got very unlucky here where the necking and the resist just happened to be right at the end to P, end fed to P fed boundary. And in our checking techniques, what we see is this is just the metal of that model. It necked and broke. So we actually have failures for both uh, minimum line width at the tips and minimum separation where it broke. So we're able to see really complex 3D failure mechanisms that stem from just the resist contour far earlier in the process flow. So uh, where this is going really is I think a, a essentially a, a double loop type of checking techniques for patterning where you're using uh, standard 2D DRC, OPC, ORC to check for single level printability issues and a more advanced three-dimensional design technology checking where you're bringing in process and variation data and applying that on the areas of concern after 2D prior to sign off. Uh, and so actually last year we did a bit of a demo uh, of this and we just showed you know this is a, a single configuration in design where it's a you know, semi-isolated pair of metal two wires with a staggered via configuration that raises some concerns. When we pass that single design configuration through many different process variation cases, we can then check the real yield problems like minimum insulator. This is a classic minimum insulator failure or minimum copper thickness failure or via to metal below interface area. So these are the real 3D problems that will limit yield. You can check them in 3D instead of trying to understand uh, with purely 2D models. Okay, my last example here, I, I want to sort of take the full jump to the end of the road where I show uh, full model-based process compensation. And one of the biggest challenges in the, in the manufacturing line is optimizing yield across the wafer. Uh, so cross wafer uniformity, it's actually a very difficult problem to tackle. You have many, many processes and what we typically do in the fab is we work on every single process individually to get a completely uniform cross wafer profile. It's nearly impossible to get every single process to the uniform cross wafer. Um, and, and the real requirement of cross wafer uniformity is that the integrated structure is uniform. It doesn't inherently matter if each individual process is uniform as long as the final structure is. So what we're able to do with Simulator 3D is take, uh, take input wafer maps of individual processes and understand how they superimpose on one another through the integrated process flow and result in integrated non-uniformity. So here I have examples of like a, a time I tried deposition thickness. This is an individual single process. I understand the variation across wafer. Here I see what is the copper cross-sectional area in an M2 line. This is an integrated measurement, and this is what really matters, that it's uniform. So I can translate unit process variation to structural integrated variation. And to start applying that to real manufacturing process compensation, uh, my view is that every wafer in the fab should have a companion virtual wafer traveling through the fab with it. That companion virtual wafer has all of the 3D process predictive geometry embedded, has knowledge of all the upstream metrology, and when these wafers arrive at tools with process compensation capabilities. So here's a, an example of a, a tool or a process that has cross wafer correction capabilities. The zone corrections can be calculated from the virtual wafer. The wafer is processed, goes into metrology, and you would update the virtual companion wafer for every wafer in the fab as it travels through the fab. So you can continually be doing 3D model-based process control and process compensation from a companion virtual wafer instead of wasting massive amounts of time and energy measuring every single structure on the wafer, every single die, uh, every single wafer in the fab. So this is how modeling and 3D predictive process predictive modeling can really start to answer the throughput concerns and the process control concerns of these advanced complex technologies. So just to wrap up, uh, I think the technology complexity we're seeing in advanced technologies is driving the need for 3D virtual fabrication. Uh, we're very heavily entrenched in technology development applications, but we're starting to see manufacturing applications pick up the mantle of 3D model-based process control. 
Um, we went through a couple of examples. Metrology applications are really already using 3D models, but by adding process predictivity, we can enhance the usage and deployment of model-based metrology. Uh, patterning and OPC has already begun to leverage some of these model-based applications, but expanding more to 3D process predictive models incorporates integration context into OPC and checking. Uh, finally, I, I really truly believe that the future of inline process control can take advantage of the, all of this modeling foundation that we're building up through all these other processes, and we can do crossway for uniformity and yield optimization using these 3D process predictive models. And uh, I truly believe that CoVenture is leading our industry, the semiconductor industry, into this new model-based manufacturing era. So with that, I uh, will conclude, and thank you very much for your attention.